My name is David Rothenberg. I'm a musician, a writer, teacher, a student of the music of other creatures birds, whales, bugs, I try and expand the sense of what music can be from the human perspective to the more than human perspective out into the natural world. Music is a way to communicate things that can be said no other way and that we can understand without having to decode them. Like when I hear a bird sing I hear an insect make rhythmic, complicated sounds. I can feel it as music without needing to analyze and figure out what it means, what it stands for. It's not like I'm hearing a language I don't understand. I'm hearing a music that touches me, that touches my emotions, a way that I think is somehow universal. It can cross from one species to another. So it's a way we can understand the rest of the world. It's a way to reach beyond human limitations. Just like we can understand different people with whom we cannot speak, we don't share their language, we can all make music together because music crosses the lines of explanation and translation, decoding and things like that. So when asked to define music, I remember I, I was always taught in school, music is organized sound. And I don't think I like that definition because all kinds of sounds are organized. That sounds like a, some kind of rigor that's separate from the phenomenon. In a way, it's, something is music if someone tells you it is. Like, consider this as music. Consider this sound as music. You know, I was a teenager, I read John Cage. He said things like that. Just listen to these sounds around you. This is music. And in a way, he's not saying that any sound is music. He's creating the music by calling attention to it by making us listen to what's going on. People make fun of him for writing a piece of music that's just silent, but what it really was was an, a, an, an evocation, a call to listen, to get everyone to listen to the sounds that are already there and take them in and appreciate them and kind of understand their relationships and feel their presence. And you can do that with the sounds made by all kinds of creatures and cities, all kinds of the waters lapping, the boats, the noises, the tourists. All this can be heard as music. You can make it music. If you hear it as music, you close your eyes, just listen, like, hmm, okay. You can say, I'm in a tourist trap. It's so annoying, there's people everywhere. Or you can just listen and say, it's music. Some of the earliest memories I have of, of music are, um, oh, there's a sound I remember, this rhythm that I heard like in nightmares. I'd wake up, maybe I was three or four years old, and I, I'd walk through the dark apartment and see imaginary monsters, and I hear this kind of, this, this kind of rhythm like ah, 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 at a certain speed. If I slow that down, I get it. The same feeling I felt as a little kid. It really terrified me, and I was running, looking for my mommy and daddy down the hall, and, and, and yet it was the music that kind of grabbed me, the kind of like menacing, repeating sound. That's one early memory I have. I think when I was uh, in elementary school, they, had, they made, made us play recorder in third grade, I think, you know, because it's easy to play. And then everyone's playing recorder. I kind of liked that. So then I thought I would go into wind instruments. And in fifth grade, when you're like 10, nine or 10, you get to pick a wind instrument. And then uh, I kind of liked the idea of playing flute, maybe saxophone. My father really encouraged me to play clarinet. He said you could play classical music or jazz. He was a big Benny Goodman fan growing up. So he said clarinet is a great instrument. And I also, I, I kind of went in that direction. I liked the idea that it had many possibilities. And it turned out, I think it was a good choice because it's very good to play with all kinds of animals. And it's also, you can carry it around, it's not that big. Although the clarinets can get big. But, <laughs> you know, you, you can, and it's not, you know, it can surprise you. It makes sounds you, uh, you get surprised by. I mean, as a, as a little kid, I walked around in the forest a lot and by the river near my house growing up in suburban Connecticut, not so far from New York. And uh, I started listening. I liked, I liked being alone with these sounds. I sort of 
kind of was interested in this. I didn't see it as connecting with music until maybe I was like 16 years old. I heard that also in Connecticut there lived a jazz musician who played with wolves and whales and eagles. His name is Paul Winter and he became known for doing things with nature in the 1970s. And he lived pretty close to me. I got to meet him a few years later and I saw, oh, you could do this. So actually, although I, although I heard that there was this musician nearby who did things like this, I didn't really do anything with it for years later. It took like 20 years before I actually seriously went out and tried to make music with nature. And that, that had to do with another like mentor and heroic figure, the Canadian composer R. Murray Schaefer. When he turned 60, which is how old I am now, there was a big conference in his honor in Canada at the Banff Center for the Arts. And I went to that, and I, there I met hundreds of people interested in various ways in music and nature connected. And I realized there was a whole world there, and that it wasn't a huge world, but there was a bunch of people interested in this, and I kind of wanted to, to be part of that world. And so I got to know people and meet them and started to plan connections. And uh, one important person there was this art professor, Michael Pestel from Pittsburgh, where they have the national aviary in the United States, all these cool singing birds. And he said, you really must come play live with these birds. It's really an amazing thing. I said, really, you can play live with birds? Hmm. And then when I went there, I realized that, uh, first of all, no birds are really paying attention at first. But then one, kind of bird, the white-crested laughing thrush. He really got interested in the clarinet and kind of interacted. And then I said, hmm, there's really a lot that can be done here. I really want to go out in the wild and do this where the birds really live. I want to expand this whole project. And so that's how um, I kind of got more into it. So this first time I was, I was in, in Pittsburgh in the year 2000, I think, we could say that's like 23 years ago. And then I uh, was walking around with my clarinet. It was six in the morning, it wasn't open yet. It's just playing little bird-like gestures. And mostly the birds were not so interested. But one bird, the white-crested laughing thrush, a common bird in India, Southeast Asia, I played this phrase, do 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 do, and he went boop, 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 boop. And then, do, 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 boop, boop. and then we didn't copy each other pretty quickly. We were playing with each other. I don't think that copying is a sign of like musical intelligence as, as some people do. But we, together we were making this music. And then I thought, hmm, this is pretty cool. And that made me realize, hmm, surprising things can happen if you play music with other creatures. That was the beginning of my interest in this. And I, I was puzzled that kind of interesting music happened. I wanted to know how much do we know what the birds are doing? How much is it honest to say birds make music? Or how much is it just wishful thinking, imagination? And that was the beginning. And then I started traveling around trying to find other birds to play with. I went to Australia where there's a bird called the superb lyre bird, L-Y-R-E, with a tail shaped like a lyre, the, the Greek instrument. and. Uh, this is one of the craziest bird songs anywhere on the planet. Really interesting to play with. And this journey years later led me to Nightingales in Berlin, which was my last big book with many different musicians up in the middle of the night in this city in Germany playing with birds. And it turns out that a city can be a great place to interact with nature. And Berlin is a great place to play music with, with nightingales. And every year I do this, I just, I just came from there uh, today. And the last two days we were playing concerts with nightingales and other creatures and always interesting things happen. Always there are surprising moments and always human musicians are changed when they start to do this. I think over time, I, I've, the biggest thing I've changed in my approach is to not imagine I'm doing it all myself as some kind of heroic figure, you know, daring to explore where no one has gone before. I want to bring other people along now. I want to make it a kind of collective group project. I'll say, come along, you join us. How about you come? Really getting people together and making it a kind of collective, resounding uh, experience like church bells ringing in a city over and over again from around and around. Humans and birds and whales can fit together in some kind of musical experience. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's very surrounding, yeah. Ooh. You could probably play with that. started with the bells, yeah. the pigeons. Okay, we can always get surprised. And in a way, like it's not just playing with uh, you know, music and animals and other musicians, but playing with, it, with, with the sounds, environments, and music happening, not in, in a disembodied way, but in a place. Music happens in a place, in spaces, and in, in, in particular locations with echoes and backgrounds and in, in a whole world of, of um, surprising you know locating features like oh, look with so much music we, we see in this the steps of these rhythms you know look at this musical score behind us of of the steps going up and these gates you see rhythms and patterns and and um, you know to find that for me to sit and and start to play and look around otherwise i wouldn't notice it in the same way like the sound is not, it's not saying anything specific about this. It's not like, like a language, but it, 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 it kind of resonates the possibilities that are there in the spaces. Yeah, and if they, what if they come across, well, remember they sent a golden record into outer space and put all this music on it because they thought like maybe the aliens will get this. They might not know our language, but the music should make sense. They weren't sure what music, so they put all kinds, which is quite fascinating. There's some whale song on there. They put some Bach. There's some Paul Winter, I think, a piece called Icarus made it to outer space. And there's Indian music. And they weren't sure what the aliens might get because we don't know what their culture is like. So I find it hard to imagine actually today, like, uh, you know, NASA or some space agency thinking in this, in this way. We've in a way gotten more conservative. Yeah, this is good. Ooh. So this is like a little dance with these seagulls there. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Lately I've been exploring making 
music with underwater sounds from ponds where you hear plants and insects making all kinds of noises. Here we're listening in a canal in Venice where there's a lot of boats. Is all the sound we're hearing human-made or might there be some creatures also? It can be hard to tell. But, uh, you know, the sound immediately you might think is just noise until you decide it isn't, until you decide you like it, until you decide it's interesting. I'm starting to hear things I think is interesting. <laughs> you know, one day it's noise, another day it's music. One day it's a drone, the other day it's a drill, you know, annoying you. You can kind of like, um, it's important to note we're not hearing any of these sounds above the water. It's only through this hydrophone, this underwater microphone, things are coming out. And so I can get away from my sense of what it is and just consider it as something interesting. <laughs> That could be a fish. So, sounding more like not a machine. So we've made something out of uh, what you might have thought a moment of noise and interruption actually turns into so much stuff has happened here. We've seen the seagulls mating dance. We've heard boats and uh, bells. And uh, you know, the thing about these underwater sounds is they're actually pretty mysterious. We really don't know a lot of what's going on there. So we turn it up a little. Yeah, we hear some machines, but there's other stuff there. Could be. What's the rhythm? Well, that's people walking. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. But, but like, yeah, I think it's an interesting mix, yeah, yeah, it definitely turns the sound into something very different. <laughs> so of course you take this outside, like, you know, in a pond with a lot of plants and underwater insects that, you know, it sounds like an organic, rhythmic, really interesting, crazy world. You know, definitely better than expected. Like, 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 I'm pretty sure it would just be, oh. but actually, you start with something that you know you don't 
expect. And uh, you, you know, it's, it's, people don't think to listen underwater. I have to try some quiet canals where there are no boats and see what's actually there. But it actually makes the sound more alive. Like I think about the boats differently now. Even I was riding on one before that you think of this, the, 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 the sonic beings coming across. And now I hear this above water sound. It's also kind of spatial in an interesting way. No. Not really, although you probably could. I'm using one that's uh, bigger and it doesn't pick up as much in this environment. It would be much quieter because it's used to louder sounds. These pick up sounds right nearby, like, like a very sensitive to what's around, which works very well in fresh water and such. And this is a kind that I sort of, kind of designed myself together with an artist in Brooklyn, Zach Poff. I heard an installation of his where the sound was incredible. Like it picked up so much more than the hydrophones I had. I asked him how he did it and he showed me and then lots of people wanted them and so then we, we so then we made a lot of them <laughs> over the pandemic, you know, I have a friend who's an engineer who made underwater speakers and he, he lives in New Jersey, but I said, can you help me make these? He goes, yeah, I'm stuck in China now. It's a good project. And so we made these. And then I was out listening to ponds and, and started me on my current project, The Secret Sounds of Ponds. And that book is coming out next year. But the music is coming out every month. I'm releasing another track. So uh, I guess one is out now, another comes out in early June. And they sort of, you hear the what can really happen in a pond, so many interesting rhythms and noises and how you can take those sounds and learn to hear it as music. And it changes your experience of even the most ordinary little swampy, mucky piece of water. Like, huh, it's now like a whole musical world. And it's not like traveling around the world to find whales or exotic birds in Australia. These ponds are right around here and they're going to sound pretty cool. Yeah, what does it have to do with uh, music? What music is, you know, you find, I'm very interested, I'm kind of traditional, I'm very interested in beauty and, and wonder and making people have an experience where they go, wow, doesn't that sound so cool? I'm not interested in the conceptual idea of music where you assault people with, with kind of really rough sounds. I want them to open up and go, wow, it's really interesting what's right here. And in that sense, I'm sort of a traditionalist, even though I'm doing these odd things. I want people to experience something beautiful, particularly in the ordinary and the mundane and what they often overlook, so that right around us, our world can instantly be more kind of inspiring and hopeful with all the terrible stuff going on in the world, and maybe in some small way, making music with the sounds of other creatures, with the participation of animals and plants in our environment. In one small way, it might help us be more aware of what we're doing to this planet and maybe save it before we destroy it all without thinking. So it's just one little way to open people up to the beauty of what's right here around us. That's what music is to me. So if you go back to this story, how I got interested, I went to the National Aviary, was playing music with birds, and then uh, I realized that you know, birds were so musical, people kind of recognized that birds sing, birds have songs, but yet scientists said something else about birds. They said birds make sounds to defend a territory, to attract a mate. If you think it's music, you're not really aware of what's actually happening. And scientists were saying one thing, poets were inspired by bird song. Composers used bird songs in very selective ways through history. Like when they decided a sound could fit into whatever system they had then, it was a little bird-like, they would admit it. But as we got more to the contemporary age, we accept so many kinds of sounds as music. Weirder bird songs seemed more musical to people. Like we really kind of expanded our sense of what music can be in the last century. And that means birds are a lot more musical. So that was the first project of my book, Why Birds Sing, and the music that goes with it, where I played live with birds and also slowed down their songs, played along with. So after that book came out, you know, the publisher said, what do you want to do next? And I said, whales. And they said, what do you mean whales? I said, whales sing. 
And he said, I don't know about that. I've never heard of whale song. I said, that's why I want to write the book. Because what happened is, is, is uh, although we've always known birds make music and sing for hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, humans have known about this. We didn't know that whales made sound until the 1950s when uh, the US Navy had underwater microphones like this thing I've got right here in this canal. And they started listening deep underwater and heard all these weird patterns and melodies and rhythms. And they were kind of mostly listening for enemy submarine activity, secret Russian codes and the like. And they were much disappointed to discover these sounds were being made by animals and that they were more like music than secret codes. And what they did say, we're not going to let people find out about this. This is secret knowledge, top secret. We must be able to use this somehow. So for about 10 years, it was very classified information that whales made songs. But then these scientists working on this, Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh, they decided, look, people should hear these songs. They're so beautiful, particularly the songs of the humpback whale. And so they released a record album, Songs of the Humpback Whale. And this became like a multi-platinum album, best-selling nature recording of all time. And it, it, it started the whole global movement to save whales until we knew about the song. Environmentalists, conservationists didn't spend much time thinking about whales. Like this was a big step. And it's amazing that this music from nature is what got people to care about these animals. And Scott McVeigh went to Japan armed with boxes of these albums and he went on national television in Japan playing the whale songs for these executives of whaling companies that were killing the world's whales at an unprecedented rate. And, and they, they would watch with tears would come in their eyes hearing the beautiful songs and the whaling uh, industrialists would say, we didn't know, we didn't know. And, and this is what led to, um, you know, global opinion turning against killing whales in the 1980s and a few countries are still hunting them like Norway, Iceland, Japan uh, and you know but by and large we, we're in, we, we think of whales today as big intelligent beautiful animals who maybe we could learn something from it's all because of their music that this happened music really touched people so I as a musician believing in music as a form of communication really wanted to go out and play live with the whales, see what would happen. And that's what my book, Whale Music, is the story of my attempt to travel around and play music with these crazy animals, different parts of the world. You know. It's a good question. I mean, you're also listening, so you can sort of, uh, you know, if we were in a place with no boats and we heard that sound, we would know it has to be something else. Like I've heard mechanical sounding things where there's no mechanical things, and then you have to wonder. Uh, often, you, if, if something's a very regular machine-like repeating thing, you, you might think it's probably a human noise, but sometimes it's not. Like that one, I don't know. But this is a boat, so I see the boat, I hear the rumble, mm, that's, prob that's a machine, but But, you know, you could be like Pythagoras, who spoke about acousmatic sound. Close your eyes, you don't know what it is, you just listen. Hear it as a kind of uh, uh, something else. Imagine what it might be, or not, you know. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. That, like, what is that? I don't know. In one sense, it doesn't matter. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, turn it into something. You can you, you be inspired by the sound in itself. Yeah. I think that's what's so interesting. That made me think that these sounds have a potential to be sort of piped into different environments, adding the above water and below. Yeah, some people use them that way. They think a hydrophone is just another effect. Put one in an aquarium, play it on stage. You coming in or out? No. Yeah. And even that one phrase could be enough to build some whole thing out of. Yeah. Yeah. See, on the sonogram, you could tell whether there were creatures in there. By by you can you can sort of tell when something is is like a little um, 
like plants are making regular rhythms, do, 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 like like really rhythmic, and then a, a creature will go like do, 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 like a bug above water, like a little a little thing that comes and goes with a strange pattern. But there's different ways to listen. Like you can listen to this as uh, a musical experience and not want to define what it is you're hearing. Like the artist Robert Irwin, he said, "Seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees." So in some sense, musical listening is forgetting the way, musical listening is forgetting the name of the thing one hears, and you just sort of hear it as a whole relationship of sounds, one on top of another, on top of another, and you're hearing how they all connect rather than what they're supposed to represent. Yeah. yeah this is totally changing the experience of sitting here. Having these sounds coming in. So it's always interesting to try these things out where you don't expect and where it leads. It sort of expands the sense of what music is from what humans are doing for pleasure, enjoyment, playing with sounds to kind of learning from the whole world as not just the environment that sustains us, that we define ourselves together with and against, but also as this world of musical beauty. Like the sounds around us are beautiful. And they are music, not just because they're organized sound. The organization isn't what matters. It's the beauty, how they touch us, what aesthetic experience is possible with all these sounds moving all around us, above water, below water, in the air, played by people, animals, birds, plants. Just taking it all in, if you, you, know, if you learn how to pay attention to it so it means something to you, you are taking it as music. And you are uh, figuring out not just what music is, but what, what becomes music, what music becomes. And music is always evolving and changing. And in our world today, where it seems like it's endlessly available, streaming freely all across the, all across the internet, we take it for granted, but music is a lot more than that. Music is an experience of sound in place with people and there's still new ways to discover it, understand it. And when we got so much music to, that we could listen to, the key thing is to really learn how to listen, to be the best listeners we can be. And I don't think the endless possibility necessarily makes us such good listeners. Sometimes we're worse listeners because we just pick something else than this, than that. We jump around. Maybe we should just listen to where we are, what is here, right now. Hmm. Right. You know, when I started getting interested in jazz and as a teenager in improvisation, I was really lucky to grow up in this town in Westport, Connecticut. It had a famous jazz record store. It was called Sally's Place. And this woman, Sally, was a real jazz, uh, very knowledgeable. And she just had these really unusual records and things that you wouldn't um, expect to find in this suburban town. And it's really quite unique. And, you know, I went there and bought my first ECM albums there. I think the first one I got was Circle, Anthony Braxton and uh, Dave Holland, Chick Corea, Barry Alshul. And this was this crazy album. And, that was, and, and I, I didn't know what to make of this. There it was in my town record store. When I listen to it now, you hear like, these are like, this is the best free improvisation you're ever gonna hear. Like, let's not do any more. Let's do something else, like record ponds and whales. But I went back there years later when, when she was still alive and her store had gotten much smaller over the years and said, hey, you know, look, remember this ECM label you sold me in these directions? Look, I made an album for this label. And she sort of laughed like, oh yeah, you know. Yeah, John Schofield was in here last week. That's, he, you know, he grew up in Wilton. And this is where he got all his music too. <laughs> and then I realized like, okay, this is really an important cultural place, this little store. So many people have gone there and learned so much. And of course, places like that rarely, hardly exist anymore. We don't discover music that way. And music is not this rare thing to be found like that. It's just as rare and important, but it's just out there to be plucked from places we usually don't tend to look. Even though there's so much 
you could listen to it any time. Many people still feel like all they hear is the same music, which suggests some kind of lack of imagination or fear of something a little bit unknown. I think people are still mostly afraid of things they can't explain, they don't know. And I try and encourage people in my writing and music and in teaching to open up to the unknown and realize it can be really interesting and accessible and right there in front of you and can bring you endless joy, possibility, and knowledge, and interest, and it's right there, you know. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to listen. You know, I've been teaching at uh, this university for 30 years, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I'm not teaching like music students, I'm not teaching people who want to become musicians and play the instruments I play. You know, this is a technical university. Most of the students are studying engineering, computer science, business, maybe design, architecture. And in American universities, you have to take some classes outside your specialty. So if you want to be a mechanical engineer or an architect, you're still going to have to take some classes in philosophy and music. And so we have our Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, and we can do pretty much whatever we want there. I can teach classes on whale music to unsuspecting engineering students. They don't realize what they're learning is very unusual. And we really have a lot of freedom, and I like teaching this audience of students. They're really, this is really a working class school. It's not expensive, it's not famous. People go to school to, to get ahead in life, get a better job and uh, really kind of, they're often the first generations in their family to go to college. So they're gonna say, what, what's the use of this? Like, you know, what's in it for me? Why should I play music with birds? Or why should I um, study these things you, you want me to study? And, and you know, I, I can make it sound really pragmatic and say like, like the, the more wide ranging knowledge you know, where you have to test your abilities to think and put things together, it's gonna serve you well whatever you do in the business world and in, in culture in general. Or I can just put, point very specific examples where, at least from my own life, where you, you learn some kind of bit of obscure knowledge that actually helps you get a job or in the business world, places you never expected it would. And that that's sometimes convinces them. But actually I find it really inspiring to teach people who are not deciding they're gonna be musicians, but they might become musicians in the process. For example, I just taught a, class in electronic music where the students came in, they mostly wanted to produce pop songs. I want to know how to make this song. I want to know how to do that. I said, yeah, you can do that. But what I want to do in class is have everyone just play together. Take out your computer and make some noise. Let's just make music together like a bunch of birds, you know, in a garden or a forest. Let's just, let's just create together something we couldn't create alone. And that ends up being a lot more inspiring, a lot more fun. Like I teach them to be improvisers when often they didn't even know there was such a thing as improvised music. We just start doing it. Or maybe I'll give someone a microphone. You're the vocalist now. I can't sing. Well, you do something. You got it, you know, and then just start doing things. And they're not c convinced that they have to do this. So they end up being surprising in their, in their kind of innocence and, and desire to explore. So you don't always want the most, the best, most committed students when you're teaching. Sometimes you want to teach in a way that anyone could benefit.